All right. Welcome to Classroom 2 Live. Today is March 12, 2016. We are missing about half of our usual crew for our moderators. Lori Moffitt is catching up a little bit on some rest. And Paul and Nago may be having some trouble due to some weather that we're having. But our stellar moderator, Peggy George, she's here. She's signing in from Arizona. And I'm Tammy Moore. I'm usually the quiet one. I'm usually doing closed captioning. But today I get to have the fun of actually being on mic. So it's a fun, fun thing for me to get to do. We are going to have a great topic today. We have got Brad Spearson here. And he's going to be telling us about participate learning. And let's go forward. And our newbie question. We're going to have an intro by, I guess since we don't have Paula, we're going to have Peggy George run the intro. Thank you, Tammy. That was a super start for our show. We are so excited to have Brad Spearson here with us today. And we actually learned about him from Paula Noggle. So I was really hoping that she would be able to join us and introduce Brad. But I am happy to introduce him because I am so glad to have discovered Participate Learning. And he is here to tell us all about it today. He's actually the VP of Content and Teacher Relations with Participate Learning. And he's the one, well, at least one of the ones who makes sure that they're reaching out to teachers and educators to find out what they need and what they want and supporting everything they would like to be able to do within Participate Learning. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about the application, that they are so responsive to all of us. He holds a master's in communication and media ecology from New York University School of Education. And his focus on the role in media and technology is in early childhood education. He's based in Chicago. He's a media expert and analyst who has served as a regular contributor to places that you'll recognize, like ABC News, TechCrunch, The Huffington Post, NPR, awesome radio shows, and dozens of other broadcast print and new media outlets. So thank you so much for joining us today, Brad. And I'm going to have you take over and answer our newbie question today, and then just jump right into your presentation. Obviously, everyone doesn't know what curation tools are. So we'd like to have you talk about what they actually are, what they do, and why you think they're important for teachers. Most certainly. Uh, Peggy, Tammy, uh, Paul is not here. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really look forward to this program. Uh, so to answer the question about curation tools, let me, let me, let me start with the, the why we need curation tools. Uh, I think it's a magical time to be uh, an educator, a teacher, a journalist, uh, because of this uh, technical transformation that we've all been living through for close to the last two decades, and it seems like things are getting a lot uh, quicker. So you know, the, the, the challenge and opportunity is keeping up with the thousands or tens of thousands or beyond resources that could help us do our job, specifically within education. That could be uh, an app, a video, a website, an open educational resource, what have you. And trying to figure out where to find them, where to store and collect them, and then also how to share them and really implement them in an instructional setting, I think is uh, you know, one of the most important challenges that we have. So from a curation tool, it could be anything from you know, copying and pasting web links on a uh, spreadsheet or a Word doc to using uh, a number of the uh, platforms and services that I, I uh, saw shared here. Uh, one of the things that we do at Participate Learning is, is, is curation oriented. 
and uh, uh, you know we, we think that collaboration is a crucial part of the mix and I look forward to showing you uh, this morning how we go about doing that. So I think uh, it sounds like I can go directly into uh, the slides. Uh, I think I go to application sharing. Very good. So uh, before I get into a live demo of uh, participate learning, I just want to give a little bit of background in terms of who we are and what we're all about. Uh, participate learning is actually a seven year old company. Uh, many on this call and many of us might remember what we were uh, originally called, which was Applelicious, uh, uh, a service to help find the best apps, whether that be education or uh, productivity, gaming social oriented. And you know, a couple of years into doing Applelicious, the uh, far and away most common uh, user generated content that we got, you know, people coming to us with lists of what they like and for what context were teachers and educators and parents who were extremely uh, interested in uh, finding the right educational tool. Uh, so, so a couple of years in, uh, we, we decided to uh, devote the entirety of our efforts to education, uh, working early on with uh, uh, teachers like Lucy Gray, you might know her as uh, Elementus uh, on Twitter. Uh, Monica Burns, Keith George, Julene Reed helped us, you know, really define a uh, taxonomy in terms of how we should first hire uh, teachers to help us review uh, initially the uh, best uh, educational applications, and then we of course expanded to, to videos, websites, etc but also an evaluation rubric and really spent years, really in 2013, 2014, working with teachers and experts, um, uh, authoring thousands of reviews of uh, apps, websites, uh, videos by grade level, uh, all you know, where applicable tagged for common core standards, showing you our evaluation process. Uh, some of the chatter uh, early on is about whether or not we trust reviews or not. We like to show all of our work and show you who's doing the work and so uh, leave it up to the user in terms of where uh, a bias might be or not. We try to quantify our assessments as much as possible via a rubric I'll show you throughout the course of uh, this conversation. About a year ago, we decided to not only have and showcase expert driven reviews, but also uh, provide a forum for others to share and curate their own collections of resources that they find at Participate Learning as well as add via playlists and collections that I'll show you. And then uh, most recently, and, and where I might begin with my live demo this morning, uh, and a lot of people know us uh, since October uh, launching uh, a Twitter client, basically a way to participate in Twitter chats um, in a more, we believe, orderly basis where um, you, know, you could really isolate on what resources are being shared during a chat as well as see who the participants are and also if it's in a Q&A format, follow either during or after the chat what that looks like. So I'm going to do a live video tour, I think. Actually, I think I'm going to share my desktop. Going to Chrome. And I think we are here. Wonderful. Uh, okay, and we are here. So, Bear with me as I get my settings on. Uh, I'm not seeing the chat during here because I have the demo on now. I do. So uh, one of the things that that we realized uh, when we were developing a 
curation and collaboration Brad? platform for teachers. Excuse me. Was Just that, one second. Yeah. Make sure you keep your browser on top. When you have the chat open there, it blocks out the screen. Yeah. And we'll make sure to jump in if there are pressing questions for you as we go along. I love it. I Thanks. appreciate the reminder. Thank you so much, Peggy. Cool. Uh, OK. So um, we, we, we found that, that in order to have collaboration, you obviously need, needed people. We had a, a, a wealth of reviews and a way to curate like what we're going to show you. But uh, in order to collaborate, you know, the key is, and what Twitter I think is, you know, I don't use the term lightly, revolutionary, is that so many people from all over the world are involved. And uh, you know, if you want to find somebody with a complementary educational interest, uh, Twitter is the place to go. Now, Twitter chats, which started, I think, maybe around the 2010, 2011 period, whether ed chat, sat chat, otherwise, uh, I think are a very novel way to, to get people involved in the conversation for a set period of time, whether it's fourth chat on Monday nights or uh, sat chat or uh, lead up chat on Saturday mornings. You know, there, there's a mechanism to get people uh, who have the same interest to talk to each other and be at the same place on Twitter at the same period of time. We think that the construction of a chat could be improved, particularly for those who do not, uh, aren't as comfortable with uh, Twitter as maybe those of us who are uh, obsessed and spending our time talking about this in the middle of a Saturday. Uh, but you know, we, we want to appeal to the hardcores as well as to uh, the newbies. So what we tried to do is first help people find chats. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is a calendar of I don't want to say all, but I think the vast majority of popular chats, primarily for K through 12, organized. Uh, and it's very easy if uh, you want, uh, you have a hashtag for your, your group, your school, your district, your event, you just let us know, provide us with some information, and we'd be happy to set it up uh, momentarily. So to give you an idea of what the chat experience looks like, and again, Peggy uh, mentioned at the, the onset of the call, in order to look into a chat, you do have to be logged on to participate in learning. Uh, you can do so via Twitter in seconds. Uh, let's go to, Paula's not here, but I think what we can do is have her uh, participate vicariously by showing her uh, and showing all, all of you this morning what fourth chat looks like. Um, so here you can obviously see a description. If you didn't know about it, log right in. And we will bring you to this page that lets you do virtually everything you can do on Twitter, on TweetDeck, on uh, other uh, major clients, but with the benefit of seeing more, um, you know, seeing what's being shared in a different way. Uh, as I mentioned, Resources are uh, you know, a very big element. So every time someone tweets with a hashtag with a link, we'll actually pull that resource and show you very easily um, how that is and, and, and whether or not it's worthy of going. And you can see here, when, when you go to a chat page uh, at the onset, it's going to by default show you the last 200 tweets, which uh, while beneficial, might not be as beneficial as perhaps seeing the transcript of, you know, let's say you missed fourth chat uh, this past uh, Monday night. You can simply, and you don't have to wait for the moderator or the organizer uh, to do it, come here. And what I'm doing is essentially and very quickly, assuming I get the right time, <laughs> creating transcripts from that conversation. So here, if you missed anything, you can live through exactly what happened. You could see who participated, and you could see a collection. Uh, so another way of curating, right? We talk about curating onto uh, a Pinterest board or a Symbolo or a Participate Learning. What this is is essentially taking all of the resources that were shared during a Twitter chat and allowing you to dive in more deeply learn about them, uh, maybe write your own annotation, 
you know, if you want to keep things tidy and you realize that, um, you know, something isn't for you, you can certainly remove this and do a lot of other, uh, a lot of other things with the chat, um, you know, and after the chat that I don't think Twitter or uh, TweetDeck is at this point set up uh, to do. I wanted to also show you examples of chats that either are happening right now or happened basically within the last 48 hours or so. So uh, during a chat, uh, we think that, that you know, if a chat adheres to the Q1, A1 format, we think that there's a more orderly way to follow the conversation than scrolling up and down on TweetDeck and figuring out, okay, wait a second, what question are we on? Or moderators continuing to uh, share pictures of what questions on, which I think are all wonderful things to do. But if there were a way to essentially, in a different column, let you know, and if this were in real time, this is a NT2T chat this morning, new to Twitter uh, chat that, that happens, uh, I think, 8.30 Central on um, Saturdays. What we're doing here is allowing you the option of seeing the chat in a more sequential basis. So here are the, here's a question. Here are all the associated answers. Um, you know, I showed off the uh, transcript uh, ability. So here I'm doing today. I'm pretty sure these guys go, let's call it 8.30 to 9.30. When you're reading the transcript, and again, anybody could do that within a matter of a couple of seconds, you have the option of reading things in raw form, or while it's awesome to see all your friends live uh, check into a given chat, like if you want to go after the fact and you just want to say, okay, what was asked, what was answered, who participated, and what was shared, we want to make it very easy for you, for moderators, for your colleagues uh, to, to really understand uh, what was going on. So, you know, you might have talked about a Twitter chat, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the next day after it happened, and, you know, you might have some colleagues that think Twitter is a way to follow the Kardashians. But you could say, well, wait a second, no, I'm just going to share this with you, and you can email them a link, and they could actually see the live conversation. These can also be tweeted, Facebook, Pinterest. So what we're trying to do is recognize all of the professional development that is taking place during a Twitter chat and really harness all of the value in the conversation, in the participants, uh, in the resources, etc. So, you know, it's great for, uh, again, those new to Twitter. It's great for, you know, some of the hardcore. Here's the games for Ed chat that happened. Um, and again, if the moderator who we have listed pull, you know, asks questions in Q1 form, we're able to recognize that, pull that in real time, and uh, hopefully provide a lot more depth to the conversation. For uh, folks like Paula and others who are moderators themselves, we give additional tools, um, including, you know, the ability to delete spam or block uh, robots or spammers on this page, not on Twitter, of course. That way you're not distracted by um, marketing, political, nefarious uh, messages along the way. So that is, that's, that's, I'm going to get back to Twitter chats again um, a little bit further in this conversation, in this presentation. But what I wanted to do was put into context, since I find the right browser, why we actually did this in the first place. And as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time in really 2013 and 2014 working with, and when I say experts, let me just show you who they are. Uh, I think you might know a lot of them. <laughs> uh, folks from all over the world, you know, an emphasis on North America and the United States, but, you know, we spent a lot of time identifying what were the best iOS, Android, YouTube, web, uh, OER applications across pre-K through 12th grade, uh, major subjects, math, ELA, science, social studies, et cetera. And then we were able to identify with the help of 
folks like Lucy and Julian and others, who were the expert content specialists? And again, on this call, and, and I know um, uh, Peggy's going to share, we're always looking for more experts, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'd be happy to, to talk individually with anyone here in terms of how to make that happen. But we wanted to really, really, what we started first was rather than just come up with software to help people click and collect and whatever, we thought it was necessary to have uh, a database uh, already of what are the best resources for any given subject. Uh, and, and what we have here now is essentially a search engine, well, it's literally a search engine, uh, where you can search by keyword, you can search by uh, subject, by grade level, so, um, you know, I prepared an example. Let's say that you are uh, working on a lesson plan or a unit for fourth grade fractions. As you see, we have autocomplete technology. I'm going to go click fourth grade fractions. I'm going to search. You get into this, what we call a search uh, engine results page where you find uh, a fair amount of information. We leave with collections. And here are, I'll, I'll show you in a second, uh, well, I guess I'll just show you now. These are essentially playlists from experts or others from the community, anyone from the community, anyone on this uh, program webinar could come and I'll show you soon how to create a collection. But here is uh, a unit on uh, fourth grade fractions and decimals. So you can see we have iOS, we have Android. Uh, we're going to have YouTube and web and all their offerings and really get an idea um, in, in kind of a, uh, if, if you wanted to, to really draw upon multiple resources from somebody who's already done the work doing the curation, uh, it's a great place to start. We also have individual uh, search results that you can facet by whatever platform. Uh, you are working on at any given time. And when you come upon a resource and a review, here are the primary elements that um, we and our expert team look into. We give everything a report card. And our rubric is actually a lot more extensive than these attributes, but we think it's easy to, to kind of show the headlines in terms of how we score things. So, uh, you know, broad buckets include educational content, features and production value, uh, engagement, we let you look at screenshots. Uh, here's how we tag it. There's a narrative, and really, really, our review is why we love it, what you can use it for, and then to the extent that something teaches a particular common core standard, we'll also uh, tag that and provide that. And we have a, uh, I guess, a no stretch policy. So part of the review process is. You know, a, a resource has to explicitly teach a particular common core standard within the use case in terms of who the reviewer is reviewing it for, and then we'll note that. If um, there's any ambiguity, we err on the side of not associating a resource with a standard because we don't want to download something and realize that it might not be applicable to your efforts. So we spent a lot of time, many years, uh, actually developing a library of all of this expert-driven uh, content. So we thought, okay, a lot of people are coming, they're searching, but they are still going to an Excel spreadsheet or a Daigo or, um, you know, Gmail or whatever. They're, they're finding resources, they're collecting them, but they're still kind of spread all over the place. And we wanted to create our own ability to curate. So uh, we, we started uh, the, the notion of creating collections. And so um, I'm going to, again, you need to be logged in, which can be done via Twitter or Facebook or Google or creating a new username and a password. I'm going to actually show you really quickly how easy it is and, and how you can go about um, creating a collection at Participate Learning. So demo for fourth grade fractions. I've created it. I can now uh, tag it to the extent if I want other people at Participate Learning to find it, I can say fractions, fourth grade, etc. 
I can also alter the visibility. You know what? I, I might be doing something for my own interest, um, or just you know I want to maybe send the link internally to colleagues, uh, or even only I want to view it. So uh, what I've done there is do this. You can give your collection a description. You, you know, um, uh, resources for yada yada, and uh, I'm not going to try to spell live, but you get the point. And then there are uh, a number of different ways you can go about adding resources uh, to your collection. So uh, for starters, you can go back to what I just showed you. And you know, there are thousands and thousands that are already vetted from our experts. And you can go about doing, let's say that you know, this is something that we liked. You find it. Ooh, I just said demo for fourth grade fractions. Great. And you know what? Monica is pretty good. Or actually, you know, Alyssa is really good too. I want to maybe bookmark all of them. Yes, I do. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go to my profile. And okay, it's always a place to find your uh, collections. I'll show you the other things you can do with an account uh, momentarily on the call, and say, okay, this is great, but you know what? There are a number of other resources that I have in mind that I want to include here that uh, aren't on participate learning, or I just want to add my own. So you can also very simply add a resource by copying and pasting the file, which I think I would imagine many of you uh, are used to via other curation. So here's the uh, YouTube intro to equivalent fractions. Uh, you can do the same thing with iTunes, with Chrome, Android, Dropbox, um, uh, really anything that is URL accessible. Simply Pasting it here, uh, you can alter the order. You can delete things. Uh, you can, let's say you have a lesson plan that you want to include uh, alongside all of your other things. This is just an um, example. It could be a picture. It could be a document. I've just uploaded that file. Uh, there are no file size restrictions at this point. Um, you know, the other thing is, okay, you're starting a collection. You have partial knowledge over the best, but you want to send an invitation to somebody. And Peggy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Please help. So what I've done here is now I'm inviting others who uh, uh, might be in my PLN, might be down the block. Uh, soon we're going to have the ability to more easily search other teachers that you find at Participate Learning. Uh, if, you, if, if they're not already on Participate Learning, you can just send them uh, an email. I'm going to send myself an email so you could see uh, what that looks like. And should be somewhat instantaneous. Oh, there it is. Brad Demo account has invited you to collaborate in a collection. You dive in here, start collaborating, and anyone that you invite into a collection can add resources to that collection. And you can also have conversations which are only visible to collaborators in a collection over here. So you might be talking about particular use cases or stuff that's not uh, applicable or maybe even sensitive in nature and you don't want the general public to see. Uh, whereas here, you can always uh, annotate for public consumption or at least consumption uh, for anybody who has that particular link. Um, a couple of other things that I want to show you. Um, bookmarks popular feature we probably don't do enough uh, of a good job promoting. So 
what does a bookmark mean? Bookmark means, okay, I am um, surfing the web. Uh, we have over here you see this PL, which is a Chrome extension. So at any given time, if you come across a page, and of course this is one of my favorite pages, it's a, a, a demo of how to use chats, but it could be anything. I have just saved that. Now I can view it in my bookmarks. And get more out of participate learning. And then at this point, I can add it to any collection that I created. So um, we talked, we, 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 we talked uh, and answered the original question about why curation is important. We think curation um, combined with co collaboration is key, uh, as well as the ability to maybe, you know, what we've done, start off with thousands and thousands of resources that have already been vetted uh, in, the, in a way that we've done it. Uh, and to come full circle back to chats, That's why, again, we created chats because uh, we have a lot of functionality that, um, that are designed around discovery, collaboration, uh, and collection. Uh, Twitter is a phenomenal way to tap into your networks and bring other people into the conversation. But if I want to go back into here, and oh, by the way, you know, this also shows me notifications as I have them. You can participate in real time. Uh, you know, I probably should have said this a little bit earlier. Also, when you're tweeting, we will automatically include the hashtag uh, that you're tweeting from. You can reply. You can retweet. You can favorite. Uh, and again, we think it's very important. So if I told you why and how we look at uh, resources coming in from our experts coming in from the community via, via, via collections, now via Twitter. So again, you can, on an a la carte basis, add this to uh, any collection that you've made or a new collection or the ability to create a collection, modify it, and do everything with a, a collection that I just showed you we think is great. Uh, we've been tickled with the response we are getting uh, from Twitter chats uh, in terms of how to embrace Twitter chats, uh, follow them, participate them uh, more easily. And uh, again, I'm really thankful to have the opportunity this morning to show you everything we have. And I'm going to see the question box answer. Uh, any questions that, that you might have? Okay, that's my cue right there. All right, there have been a few, few questions <laughs> that have been coming in. I think this one pretty well was covered. Yeah. You were showing, you know, we could select the time frame. But just to be sure, I'm going to go ahead and ask this one. Peggy had asked, if you don't select the time for the actual Twitter chat, would it bring all tweets with that hashtag, not just those during the actual hour of the chat? Yeah, so I will go, let me go back to, so I haven't selected any time period at all for uh, the new to Twitter chat. So what it does is by default covers the last 200 chat tweets that have included that particular hashtag. And then at any given time you can load previously, which is 100 chats, uh, I'm sorry, tweets before that. By time period, at any given point, if you know when a chat happened, or um, you know, not even a chat, maybe a slow chat, or maybe uh, a lot of conferences use uh, us, uh, South by Southwest EDU this past week, you know, we set up a page where you know, during particular presentations, a way to crowdsource resources by, by doing that. Um, you can determine the time. You can also go last up to we include all the way up to here, the last two hours, and then time period here, you can capture any four hour period of time. It's probably a very long answer to a simple question. I think, I think thoroughness though is very welcome. Uh, another question that came <laughs> in, this one was from Maureen. Can you follow two chats at once? So, I mean, technically you can because I'm here and I can go to another browser and go here, right? So I mean, we're at a time of day right now where I don't think there are two live chats, so I'd be showing you a historical. 
example. Uh, so the way to do it currently is having two browsers open at the same time. Um, obviously, TweetDeck is designed where you can add an additional column. Uh, and and we, we, we are cognizant of that. We are also cognizant that, that we are not trying to replicate TweetDeck uh, and create the same service, but we do want to accommodate uh, many of us who like to participate in a lot of different chats at the same time. So while right now you can do so here, we are working on uh, another way uh, that you can, you can more quickly access chats uh, that are happening in real time. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we you know, devote our screen real estate to the chat the moderator, the participants, the resources, and then obviously uh, questions and answers columns. So uh, we deliberately are doing what we are doing and, and we look forward to your feedback now and as we bring out uh, a way for us chat junkies to access uh, a lot of them really quickly. Okay, and there was one that was close to that one. I, I think it showed Pretty clearly, it was on the tab. But since the question came in, I want to make sure they really saw it clearly. They had asked if you need to run a separate browser for doing two at a time or different tabs. But hopefully, they saw as you were demonstrating it that in yeah, the different tabs. Tab. Uh, as you can see, uh, I think a lot of us probably have a lot of tabs open at the same time. But we think it's also you know it's 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 very important to be able to access all of this rich uh, material, but I know it could be a Sunday night or a Monday night and there are five different chats going on and you want to drop into each of them. So uh, we're cognizant of that and stay tuned. All right, sounds good. A couple more questions then. Let's see, we had, um, had several questions related to the media. Peggy had asked, can you view the videos right in participate, the participate learning? And another one that was very similar, let me see if I can find that one. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Are the collections mixed media? I mean, are there just iOS collections versus Chromebook versus website collections? Those, those I was thinking they were closer related than they are. I guess they're not. Sure. So maybe uh, the first one first about uh, can first you watch one, yes. Yeah. Right so right you're in the right search right? engine result. You're right here. You want to view YouTube? Here's Salcom. Uh, and the black is because it's his blackboard. Uh, <laughs> it, it does show up. There he goes. Uh, so yes, you can view them in line uh, to make your determination of whether or not you want to clip or to curate. And then by design, uh, collections are of course uh, heterogeneous in nature. Uh, we don't require you to uh, collect resources for the same platform all in one. We think it's necessary because our lives are such that, and our, and our students are such that, that you know, you might have some on iPad, some on Chromebooks, some on anything. So we accommodate most of the collections that you see at Participate Learning involve resources uh, from multiple platforms. Uh, most recently, uh, OER resources, so open educational resources, uh, is something that we're uh, spending a lot of time with. We're actually working with the, the Department of Education on an initiative where if you tweet participate OER uh, alongside an open educational resource, we will store that the same way we store a uh, resource on a given chat. Uh, that way, you know, we, can, we can essentially crowdsource what are all these OER resources that, that we're discovering and then send you back a link if you're interested to help us uh, include additional coverage metadata. Etc. Answer two questions. Answer three questions and only two. <laughs> we did pretty good there with that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Maureen was the big asker of questions. Had a lot from Maureen. Can you collect awesome. just for your organization? Yes. Um, so a couple of different ways, right? Then everything that I showed you uh, on this call is and will remain free. So uh, organizations can collect. By and we have schools doing this. I mean, we can. And uh, Maureen, I'd be happy to to set up a, a hangout to kind of show you how other district schools, uh, et cetera, are doing this. But anyone can, can create, and we have schools creating hundreds and hundreds of different collections around uh, 
different units, different grade levels, different teachers, however they want to slice and dice. We're kind of agnostic. There's a big sandbox of tools uh, to play with. Others like, um, let me show you an example of a district in uh, Billings, Montana that is doing something. It's kind of a hybrid uh, six-week chat sprint as well as hashtag-based uh, curation. So I think they're, they do these weekly chats on, let's see, Billings, Montana, BPS Ed Chat. And so what's happening here is uh, the moderators, Ann and, and, and Tracy, are encouraging folks at their district to, ha to, to tweet resources alongside um, this hashtag that we set up. That all you have to do is ask us, uh, BPS Ed Chat. And here's a way for their organization to crowdsource. And then what they've done is for the period of six weeks, they have one hour uh, chats to kind of stimulate uh, conversation and curation. But this is uh, available at all time. One of the things that I noticed that I forgot to, to point out is when you see participants and you see a, a green bubble, that means they're a participate learning member. And it's a way of uh, us providing a badge for those who are in the chat that are also uh, via participate.com. So there are a number of examples. Schools and districts keep on asking us how to do it. Uh, you can do it via the hashtag. You can do it via collections. And you can do it via other ideas that you bring to us. Because uh, uh, it's my job to listen with two ears and one mouth as to how to make your lives easier as educators, as curators, et cetera. And everything that I showed you has been built based on feedback from conversations like this. So uh, we, we, we are extremely appreciative to any ideas uh, you can provide in, in terms of how to make this stuff better. Okay, great answer there. All right, I uh, had another one. Maria was wondering if you pull your resources from several collections into a new one. Does it automatically take out redundancies? That's a good question. Uh, so it, it, it will, not yet, uh, but that's, that's an example of feedback that we will be processing and give us uh, a little bit of time and it will. Okay, and we had another one. Um, the one where uh, it automatically adds the hashtag when you, when you post something. Yes. They were wondering, is it added to the end of the tweet, at the beginning, or? So by, yeah, by default, it will add to the end. However, if you wanted to include this tweet in the narrative in your own certain way, so I'm just going to, this is a test for hashtag BPS Ed Chat. So now I've typed it, and we no longer have that restriction, right? So if during a chat, things can move pretty quickly, and sometimes you forget to do it. So by default, we have it at the end. But if you wanted to put it in, we'll recognize it and not eat up any of your uh, Twitter real estate. We'll also give you a count of what to do. And we also, of course, allow you to uh, include a picture. And I didn't even get into our scheduled tweets where anyone um, can schedule a tweet just as they can uh, on other platforms, complete pictures, etc. So here's me answering, including things that I forgot earlier in the demo and in my answers. All right, we had a question from Peggy. She was wanting you to here we go. Explain how chat hosts use the Q and A feature so they appear in the right menu. Yes. So that's that's the key. Um, so we. Our job at Participate Learning, and one of our jobs is to identify who the, who the organizers are and who the moderators are and basically who is it or, or you know, one or multiple individuals during a chat who are literally asking questions in Q1 format. And so, you know, a question would need to be, you know, in Q1, comma, or any variation thereof, like you know, question one, um, I did I said comma and then colon, Q, Q1 dash. So once what we have the moderator handle listed here, and anything coming from these moderators that has this or variations of this format 
will end up here. And then anybody else that has the associated A and um, let's see if I can okay A or you know here's uh, the 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 A one uh, will will follow alongside. So it's a bit of a trial and error uh, that we're we're learning um, uh, in terms of like some really interesting variations in terms of how the the term question one could be asked. But uh, this technology, so you know, is about 11 days old. So uh, we're, we're learning a lot uh, along the way. Okay, that one sounds pretty good. We did have a brand new newbie in with uh, the group today. Didn't know what the hashtags were. So I don't know if you want to point them to an outside resource of where they can have a glossary of how Twitter works, or if you want to just answer it here, just to get a basic feel for what are the hashtags. Sure, sure. So, um, I'm going to hashtag and good morning is, oops, sorry. What you want to do is, whether it's during a uh, Twitter chat or, and let me, I'll, leave, I'll go to a, Twitter. So, so if you want to follow along with something that's happening at any given moment, or you know, Snapchat is an example of a very popular Twitter chat, and you want to see what people are talking about, tagged under the word Snapchat, uh, which means the Saturday chat, um, you can. And I'm tweeting that. You can search for. All that information, either via Twitter, obviously via participate learning, etc. So what people do when they are tweeting is if they tweet a hashtag, that's, that's basically recognition to other people that are tweeting or following the same hashtag that they are involved either in a real-time conversation like a chat, uh, a slow conversation uh, like uh, Celebrate Monday or Fly High Friday or a uh, hashtag could be associated with South by Southwest EDU, whatever. So, so it's, it's a way to determine or basically associate a tweet you have with a particular conversation movement idea and then when people are searching for you on Twitter or they're embracing you on uh, Participate Learning, that hashtag is a breadcrumb, so to speak, that basically ports all of those tweets and thoughts and, in our case, resources associated with that particular tag of the conversation. I hope that uh, answered the question. That's great. And also, while you are explaining it too, lots of people were also adding in additional links into the chat, so some additional places as well for them to be able to, to pick it up. Awesome. Uh, it's kind Thank of you. one of those. It's kind of like potato chips. Once you get started, <laughs> it stop. But you know, sometimes it's the okay. How do you open the lid to the container so that you can get that first chip? Yeah, so, yeah. And then so you know, that'll get sometimes you it's like a box of chocolates because with some hashtags, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> exactly. All right, and uh, let's see. We had uh, Craig made the the question in the chat. Anyone else concerned about bandwidth limitations and pinging? on use of these resources at school? For me to comment, or is that a question to the yeah. group? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't I was thinking myself, I was thinking, well, it's, it, Twitter chats don't take a lot of bandwidth. But I guess if you start having people playing lots of videos that are shared, perhaps that's what, what might have been what the concern was. Potentially. I, I think, um, I mean, there, we, there's there's a wider philosophical argument about uh, you know accommodating video and and uh, bandwidth schools, et cetera. But I mean, what what we are is a way to view, sample, collect, and share. Um, it's not a place necessarily where you're constantly watching videos and, and getting everyone watching. With you know, we're 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 a discovery mechanism, right? So we're a place to find it. Verify whether or not it's good, including your own lesson, and then you know. I assume if if the school accommodates uh, 
you know, any kind of video, I don't think that we are necessarily um, um, uh, providing or putting any more stress on that. We're just a way to we're a way to find it, share it, and um, find the next one. Yeah, my son's a network administrator at in a public school district, and you know, it's always getting better. You know, time goes by, and and more and more that bandwidth, and the IT people find better ways to make it efficient. So, mm -hmm. if you are in a school where it's a little tight at first, maybe just trimming down, uh, saving videos for later after you get home or something initially until that bandwidth all gets caught up. Um, and so Peggy says, so if all students in a class were logged in to participate learning, working collaboratively on a collection, there should be a problem with bandwidth. So kind of a follow-up on that one. Yeah, there wouldn't, uh, I mean, if we, we, there wouldn't be a, follow, a, a problem, obviously, on our end. Uh, I mean, we have many, many, many users, obviously, working concurrently uh, at participate. Uh, I don't, each school or district might have its own uh, settings, but I don't. We, there's nothing particular about us that would uh, put more stress on uh, any any school bandwidth. Uh, I would think really in the long run, in the long run, it actually reduce it because everything can so efficiently be pulled together. And instead of running here and there and everywhere, you know, you've got it right there, and you can bookmark it to look at it later and things like that. So it looks pretty good. Yeah. All right, that's, and that um, can add a benefit. Right. <laughs> That's pretty much all of the questions that I have that came in, but there may be a couple of new ones. So I'll just make one last call here. Is there anyone that needs to slip a question in really quickly? We're about ready to close up. All right, looks like that's pretty much it. So what we'll do is we'll switch back over to this slide. Thank you so much. This was an excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you so, so we'll much for including me. You're welcome. We'll switch back over here to slides then, and let's see. Actually, let's just let me go ahead and do it this way, so you don't even have to worry about turning it off. I'll just go ahead and bring it across. All right, we're going to go back over to slides, and we may have a few slides we'll pass because there was a backup just in case. Yeah, we had most, of, most everything else I had here uh, was in the event that there were some web issues that we didn't encounter. Um, so I, I, I want to reiterate that if anyone is on uh, this presentation that is interested in uh, learning more about how to uh, apply this, you know, just for their own personal discovery with their schools, with their districts, everything else, please send me an email at brad at participate. Dot com. I, uh, I do many, many, many Google Hangouts. Uh, I love talking and learning. Uh, uh, and um, you know, please do not hesitate uh, to, to contact me because um, you know, this, is, this is what we do and this is how we get better and this is how we get to know more folks like you that are so passionate, of it, passionate about education and how to apply technology to what you do. Okay, sounds good. There was one question. I, I must have missed it somehow. I do feel like this would be an important one to get in there. Um, what are the future plans? Free forever, freemium, premium? I think that's an important one to slip for in there. For sure, for sure. So everything that I just demonstrated is and will remain free. Uh, you know, we are a, a, a for-profit company, of course, uh, and we do think that there are freemium uh, opportunities as it relates to, um, you know, like there are ways that schools and districts are using this right now on existing tools, but you know I think that there's a lot more in terms of analytics, uh, in terms of custom taxonomies, custom ways of not not only not only providing a platform for uh, teachers and educators to to share and curate, but but then to to get a deeper understanding in terms of the effectiveness of what they're doing. But uh, those are further further down the line, our interest, uh, you know, and in, in our main focus right now is to get people to understand us, know that we're a place to curate and collaborate and share, grow a social network, and um, we think if that happens, a lot of good things will happen for all of us. Yeah, sounds good. And, and Peggy brought up another one there, but I think this one's probably more with your with the district 
not really something that you can control anyway, but uh, many districts will block social media media tools and has it been an issue. That one probably is more or less one that you would, you know, you have to take it up with your IT department as to what they yeah. block and they don't block. So it's not really it's not really something that can necessarily be controlled outside of the outside of the district. And if they block Twitter, um, you could still log in with us uh, via your own username and password or Google or whatever. I mean, we, so we've had experience, you know, and, and some don't allow YouTube. So there are certain things we share up and there are certain ways and mechanisms. But yeah, the workaround uh, would be, uh, you know, cre you know there, there are other ways to log into our site beyond Twitter. And we've experienced absolutely no uh, limitations or blocking uh, from schools uh, at this point. And having my son be in the IT of a school district, they are bribable. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> All right. So, considering the time, we better we better quickly turn it over to Peggy to cover upcoming shows. Peggy, take it away. Thank you so much, Brad. We are very excited to hear more and more about Participate Learning, and especially to hear about how responsive you are to the teachers that uh, get in touch with you to let you know what they'd like to see added or need help with using it. Your support is tremendous. So I'm hoping we'll have a bunch of people become interested in becoming an expert on your site and start adding their own resources and sharing blog posts and so on with you. So thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I hope you'll be back next week. Next week we have Kathy Beck joining us. And her topic is Global Google Mapping. But she's not only talking about Google tools, but all kinds of tools that you can connect with people in other schools and around the world, you're going to love her presentation. And the following week, we're going to revisit Remind.com. They've had a lot of updates, and more and more people are starting to use it, and we want to hear all about it. Then on April 9th, we have an amazing eighth grade student joining us. Her name is Coco Khalil. And she's going to be talking all about makers and how to support them, both boys and girls. And she uses a drill press as her example. And then remember, we won't have a show on April 16th because that is the Den Spring Virtual Conference. So we do hope to see you back next week. And I do want to remind you that there's a great day of learning coming up this week on uh, Library 2.0 about privacy in the digital age. We all have so many questions about things related to security and privacy and um, things that we want to be able to teach our students. Those will all be recorded and used. Um, and available to you after the conference if you can't make it during the day. But it's designed specifically to support librarians. So I hope that some of you will be able to take advantage of that. And Tammy, you can go ahead and take us out with these final slides. Yes, indeed. All right, Steve Harganon, if you have followed him for a while, you realize that he started out with all kinds of new ideas and created lots and lots of resources out there for teachers. But sometimes there were so many it was hard to find. So in the last couple of years, he's pulled them all together into one location. And you can find them at the Learning Revolution Project. So take a look. Join up at that meeting. Get into their news loop to find out about all kinds of things that are coming up. There's a link that Peggy has posted right there in the text chat. Also, whenever you leave, you are going to automatically go to a survey. And you can nominate a featured teacher. So if you've got some ideas of some great people that you'd love to have us bring in as a presenter, just go ahead and make the suggestion right there. There's a little form that you can fill out. Also, within that survey, you can also uh, find the links that you need to the varied resources that we have. And I know for a lot of you, it's really helpful if 
for your showing that you've participated in something and get some credit for that. You can also, in the survey, set it up so you can get a certificate of participation. And one thing to make sure whenever you do that, don't use your school for your, your email address because sometimes it doesn't make it all the way through. So go ahead and use your own personal email address. And this will come to you. It has your name in it and everything. It's really nice. All right, and at, we have a video collection and an audio collection. So today's recording will be available. It'll be a couple of hours. Um, Peggy does a lot of work that a lot of us don't really realize. She puts these together so nice. So you can go ahead and get the uh, whichever format works best for you. All right, and also you can uh, sign up with the RSS feed, and you can find that whenever you go to the classroom 2.0 live site. Look for the classroom, look for the little RSS feed that we've got right there. And so, if you use that, that can bring all these resources right there to you. And of course, we want to give a special thanks to Brad for giving the presentation today. Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 Live and Future 2.0 and Future of Education and the Learning Revolution. And Blackboard Collaborate provides this platform for us. Very, very helpful. And of course, you, everyone who participated in today's show. We thank you for coming in. We'll hope to see you again. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.